Hello, welcome back. We are just about to bring on Dr. Leslie Ann Sakaku as our next presenter. I just wanted to give a little bit of background about Dr. Sakaku. And we have, um, she, Dr. Sakaku has been recognized as Doctor of the Year by the Scleroderma Foundation. And this is an award that recognizes leadership and commitment to the community battling scleroderma. Dr. Sakaku has a long, um, list of credentials associated with scleroderma and specifically she in 20, 2011 she established the scleroderma and sarcoidosis patient and research center between both Tulane and Louisiana State University and has received international recognition as a center of excellence by both the European scleroderma trials and research group by the scleroderma foundation and by the scleroderma clinical trials consortium um, I also want to mention that Dr. Sakaku is currently an assistant professor of clinical medicine at Tulane University School of Medicine. And she's also an internationally, obviously you can tell from uh, the previous comment, recognized researcher, educator, and clinician in scleroderma, also in sarcoidosis, myos, my, my, okay, I can't say that one, sorry, pulmonary hypertension and interstitial lung disease. Dr. Sakaku is a leading um, researcher and has established the Pulmonary Hypertension Clinical Program at LSU. Now it's called the LSU Tulane Collaborative Comprehensive Pulmonary Hypertension Center at the University Medical Center. And she, and, um, she, is, a, and she is a co-director there. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring on Dr. Sakaku and make her our presenter for now. Okay, hey, terrific. Thank you so much. So uh, thank you so much for inviting me to be here with everybody and uh, and uh, participate in in such a honorable way in the Blue Bonnet chapter, the Scleroderma Foundation's Education Day. It's an honor to be here. And my topic is befriending the scleroderma gut. And I, I spelt it a little bit differently because befriending, um, when we're thinking about being somebody's friend and or these important relationships like the gut like other important relationships it's a constant renewal and uh it's uh not so much like when we're on facebook and we click a button and then we're somebody's friend <laughs> it takes a lot of nurturing it takes a lot of thought and space and um self-kindness and self-friendliness um, and so hence the reason that I chose this particular spelling of befriending the God. So these are my disclosures and these are some of the supporting organizations. Um, I do want to let folks know up in front and center that we do have a scleroderma diet study that's still uh, running. Um, and please feel free to contact me. I'll show this slide again later uh, or Dr. Kelly Jensen um uh, and uh, we've been enjoying doing this study with participants from around the globe um and it's a remote study so the overview of what we're going to talk about today is we're really everything that is going to be discussed is going to hinge on cultivating a friendliness with ourselves with our gut and um and and that healing is essentially through our self-kindness and self-management and this relies on the four pillars which we'll go on to speak about shortly but fundamentally um, we are the pilots of our own health and the focus is on us is on you each day each moment and um, the connection to our to our health is ourself and that we know best what's up for ourselves and, and over time we learn better what's uh, good for ourselves the other thing that I'm going to be harping on again and again is, is that the gut the gut likes things to be smooth and happy and soothing and slow and the gut loves when we're kind to ourselves and we put ourselves in kind environments and think of ourselves and make choices for ourselves that are kinder um, a lot of the talk is also going to focus on the attention creativity and also the curiosity uh, in learning more about ourselves 
what works for ourselves, um, and cultivating that sensitivity toward ourself, which is in regard to our symptoms, our uh, food tolerance, what we can tolerate, how we can tolerate it, um, and how we organize ourselves around food and food ritual, and um, and how we think of ourselves each day. And every day is different from every other day, but sometimes developing um, ways of being um, can be strong enough to help us through the days that are more difficult or the weeks that are more difficult. Um, and that's when that's when these habits that we cultivate over time really come through and carry us. Uh, and uh, we'll focus on GI comfort in scleroderma and how this, as human beings, we all of us, um, whether we have a condition called scleroderma or not, our body is interrelated and everything else affects every other part of ourself. And so we're going to focus on this, but more so shedding a light on systemic sclerosis. Um, and that some of the symptoms that we are experiencing might influence how well we're able to help some of the other realms of the condition that might be active for us. And so th through that, we'll be looking at improving symptoms, comfort, ease, we're we'll looking at safety, nutrition, and overall health. And here are the four pillars, eat, sleep, move, and beauty. And if we keep cycling through this, concepts through these concepts in our day just checking in with ourselves eating sleeping moving are we putting ourselves in a beautiful environment if we're feeling overwhelmed could we take just a minute to look outside of our, our window or look at something else in the room and that can change our frame of mind and open up a field that's more um, uh, offering of um, some of soothing um, intentions towards ourselves. So eating and nutrition uh, is essential for everything. Um, sleep influences not just our levels of inflammation, not just our immune health, but um, but our other biomechanisms. Our sleep quality uh, has influence over, and we'll talk a lot more about moving as being essential to all of these realms of health including nutrition, including our gastrointestinal health, including easing our gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, just a quick flash about nutrition, <laughs> an image of nutrition, and uh, just a sweet little uh, image to remind us how lovely sleep and how nourishing sleep can be, and that movement is every little bit that we do, even getting up, uh, uh, moving over and to the to the waste bin just to, to put in a piece of paper or something like that. Every little thing that we do, every little move, just standing up, uh, sets off a cascade of healthfulness of chemicals in the body that do all sorts of things, like break down um, cholesterol, um, uh, in, increase the uh, cytokines that drive down inflammation. We'll talk more about that, and then beauty. Just take a minute to imagine one of the most beautiful places that you were at recently in the past, uh, maybe before COVID or not, or maybe the beauty outside your window and how that changes us, how that changes our breathing and how that might influence any symptoms that we might be feeling. So all of these Ill areas, these pillars, as I refer to them, are, um, Interinfluential, and um, this is a very famous quote: "In difficult times, you should always carry something beautiful in your mind." And this is a quote from Blaise Pascal, who was a 15th century, uh, sorry, 17th century um, mathematician and physicist, physicist who was uh, imprisoned. Um, and this. Is not just for mental health, but we can see from studies that are done um, through uh, the National Institutes of Health, this is very, very much related and correlates to immune health um, and, and uh, health outcomes and survival. 
And so a lot of what I've just been talking about, you can find um, you can find content uh, on um, Facebook and YouTube, where we have a YouTube channel. Even though it's not the most high production, the content is still worthy. Um, and so now let's just take a quick moment just to feel what the gastrointestinal system likes. You can, if, you're, if your hand can manage to reach your chest and the other one to your stomach, you can allow your eyes to gently close or just partially close to a hazy gaze in front of you. And just notice the wave that rises up to meet your hands and the wave as it falls away from your hands. And one more wave cycle. And then allow your eyes to soften to open. And this type of reassurance, this type of soothing is what the gastrointestinal system uh, optimally prefers. This slowness, this smoothness, this ease. And so a lot of what might be on people's mind is, well, what is the right diet? What is the right way to go about eating or doing when I have a condition like systemic sclerosis and, and how this relates to my GI tract? So the one thing that I would like to say is, is that waking up with this robust kind of feeling of I'm going to do it today, I'm going to change my life, and I'm going to start afresh, start anew, right now. Hmm, well, that's not really going to be a friendly, friendly gesture to ourselves so much as being kind and, and looking at these concepts more as a habituation, these small habits that we introduce and practice and, and, uh, and sometimes live up to, sometimes not live up to. It's all just part of the process, but it's really focusing on this habituation um, and this kindness and self-regulation and self-care and attention and noticing, noticing when we are engaging in it, and then noticing when maybe we're not, and that it's okay if we're not, and that we just bring our attention back kindly to our selves and gently ease back into better choices. Again, <laughs> even that aspect the gut prefers even if we stray from what our uh, um, overall intentions are, if we employ our uh, self-witnessing with some kindness, we're going to go a lot further, says the gut, in terms of uh, how we feel and how the gut feels and how easy it is or not to, um, to create happy uh, habits that, carry us through. So nutrition, let's just start talking about nutrition. Nutrition, so what? So what? Because we forget about food. We forget about the food choices. We, we think about others, but we are always last minute when it comes to ourselves, especially if you are the primary nurturer. But nutrition is essential for um, cognition. It provides the nutrients and the cofactors and the minerals that we need for good cognition, alertness, um, 
mental health, um, how we eat influences the levels of our mental state in terms of anxiety, depression, our ability to manage stress, to ride along with stress because life, there's no question, brings us stress and we cannot escape it. And uh, uh, even if you're a guru, you cannot take away stress. Stress is there in life, but it's just how we dance with it. It's how we ride with ourselves, and how kind we are towards ourselves when we have stress. And nutrition, healthy nutrition helps us to do this. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. It impacts happiness, um, good nutrition. Uh, it, it addresses fatigue and our energy levels. It's essential for muscle health. Um, it's important for blood production, bones, healthy nerves, and in scleroderma, it's very important for wound healing and skin protection, and ultimately, nutrition creates the building blocks of a healthy immune system that protects against uh, infection and responds rapidly to the presence of infection. So nutrition, in terms of systemic sclerosis, um, is such that 56% um, of people living with systemic sclerosis may be malnourished. And this could be from the many um, various manifestations related to gastrointestinal health and systemic sclerosis. 90% of people living with systemic sclerosis will have some kind of GI involvement. Uh, and malnutrition uh, uh, is something that um, it's a, it's it's a path that's um, easily a downward spiral. Um, prior uh, in the uh, uh, 70s, uh, 80s, there were studies done there, and there were there was a 12% mortality associated with malnutrition and systemic sclerosis. Um, and more recently, this has been uh, reduced to 5%. This may be because we have these wonderful um, new drugs that uh, appeared around the turn of the century called proton pump inhibitors, which um, I believe uh, most uh, of people with systemic sclerosis should consider being on and talk very carefully with your with your scleroderma specialist about this but proton pump inhibitors like omeprazole um, like protonix nexium lansaprazole i'm mixing up generic names and brand names but since initiation of proton pump inhibitors and we'll talk a little bit more about this later um, there's been a thwarting of esophageal destruction and systemic sclerosis which is a large which is a large component of malnutrition because um, of the damage to the esophagus. And proton pump inhibitors, what they do is they address the injury related to reflux disease and systemic sclerosis. And we're gonna talk more about that. So in nutrition, what this is not really what our talk is about, but just to give you a thumbnail, um, the average person needs about 2,200 to 3,000 kilocalories, depending on the age, sex, um, and their activity levels. And this is, comes from a combination of proteins, fats, carbohydrates, and including micronutrients such as vitamins and minerals, very important variants of diet. Um, and this is very difficult thing, I think, for people with systemic sclerosis, because when we think of a colorful diet, uh, we think about lots of raw fruits and vegetables and bad experiences we may have had with overeating or um, or eating a texture of one of these um, very colorful uh, vegetables that left us feeling perhaps bloated or cramping. Um, and so we may not have some good memories of that. But but variance and variance of color represents a variance of nutrients and a variance of um, nutritional cofactors that are really important to introduce into the diet. Um, and even in people that have gastrointestinal distress, it, it is an important consideration. I would just like to say also that muscle to fat 
ratio is very important. So when we're looking at the, our body mass index, um, which is our height compared to our weight, which is the which is the most common way, it may not be very accurate because it does not guarantee that you actually have good nutrition. What the body mass index is really a, a reflection of. Um, more predominantly used for is to gauge obesity and um, and in systemic sclerosis that may not be a, a strong um, issue so but what we're really concerned about is the muscle to fat ratio we like to have more muscle um, and we're going to talk more about food tolerance and food variance so let's just talk a quick minute about diet um, I don't want to spend much time on this as you'll see we're going to fly through some slides but um, but diet, paying attention to what you eat, is um, the overall solution that we what we can glean from looking at meta-analysis of diets. Um, and and what this means for systemic sclerosis means that a healthy weight maintenance, preventing that downward spiral of malnutrition, and microbiome health. So all of when all of the aspects of why nutrition is so important for us that we discussed a few slides ago also hinges is on this concept of microbiome health and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment so gluten and and um, systemic sclerosis it's unknown but overlap of uh, celiac disease is, is a possibility um, this is being studied at the moment and it's uncertain where um, where uh, the gluten interaction and systemic sclerosis um, stand with each other. The, the same is true with FODMAP diets. Um, so this is very well explained online. I believe Dr. Tracy Freck has a very nice um, Scleroderma Foundation video that talks about FODMAP diets. And there is also another foundation um, video uh, by a nutritionist on FODMAP diets and slowly introducing um, food based on the, the FODMAP principles and building tolerance in that, in that manner. Um, so, but the overall concepts that I'd like to impart are that uh, gastrointestinal health, gastrointestinal comfort um, is often in, inter-influential. Um, gastrointestinal comfort can influence how our lungs behave, how freely and easily we feel that we're breathing and also how easily and freely that we're moving and all and the ability to have ease in all of these areas impacts our overall health so overcoming certain issues um, in systemic sclerosis it, it, in regard to systemic sclerosis it's important to pay attention to certain things and ask ourselves, are these issues impairing us in other ways? So if we were just to balloon open this concept of nutrition and look at how systemic sclerosis might impact um, our ability um, to, uh, to address our nutrition, um, uh, we can look in terms of breathing difficulties uh, when we when we're breathless when we cough a lot that burns up a lot of calories meaning that um, we're, we're requiring more to meet our nutritional needs um, high states of inflammation um, uh, can also burn a lot of calories um, depression and anxiety can, can decrease our motivation and reduce our calorie intake. Um, fatigue and exhaustion, again, impair motivation are a hurdle. Mouth pain and difficulties chewing, uh, difficulties wetting our mouth can um, make eating uh, something that takes a long time. And so we then do not fulfill um, our volume necessary for calorie intake. Another area is systemic sclerosis is associated with hand pain and hand function related to arthritis, digital ulcers, contractures, um, 
uh, rhinos, um, and these can all impair our ability to feed ourselves, to prepare food. Um, generalized body pain, the same, interferes with motivation to prepare food or even just to eat. Um, and then again, food intolerance, this causes a reduction of calories. If we're afraid to eat certain foods, if we don't know how to prepare certain foods so that they are uh, of tolerance for us. And in other manifestations of systemic sclerosis, for example, like diarrhea, causes us to lose calories, lose hydration, um, and uh, important minerals. And also when we're experiencing diarrhea, um, we often feel cramped or bloated, and we don't also uh, have the appetite to eat. Um, and then again, malabsorption syndromes in systemic sclerosis can cause a loss of calories and nutrition. So the impact of gastrointestinal discomfort and mischievousness, as I would say, really affects um, most every part of our, our bodies. Um, and and, and every other part of our body affects the ability for us to neutrify ourselves. Um, so I just wanted to do a quick roadmap of uh, the GI system and systemic sclerosis. And um, so if we, we consider that systemic sclerosis can impact the human body from mouth through the entire GI tract um, through to the anus, um, we we'll start by looking at the mouth. So of multiple issues related to the mouth, insufficient wetting of food is a, is a big issue. And taking the time to be able to uh, allow for enough um, salivation to develop in the mouth, to pool in the mouth is really important uh, and chewing thoroughly. So we can have uh, discomfort in the mouth because of lack of salivation or because of uh, dental issues related to systemic sclerosis. And therefore, we likely um, would have to allow ourselves more time, perhaps more time upfront in preparation to prepare food so that we can eat it more more efficiently um, and more time to chew and to wet the food because digestion digestion in the human body it begins in the mouth my argument is is that digestion begins before we even put it in the mouth by the ways we prepare food we'll talk a little bit more about that but but digestion begins in the mouth and we have to allow sufficient time for chewing. And therefore, again, we come along these principles of taking time and really allowing ourselves to chew and taste the food. Um, uh, the next area following on from the oral cavity, um, and oh, sorry, and also um, facial, Facial tightening can also influence our ability to chew and our ability to mouth uh, uh, widen our mouths oh, large enough for food to enter into. And so we have to be tolerant to that as well and perhaps requiring eating in small, smaller bites. Um, so the next following on is the esophagus. Um, people with systemic sclerosis suffer impaired swallowing. Um, oftentimes due to reflux damage, damage from acid that's um, coming up, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, and irritating the lining of the esophagus. And for this reason, um, before proton pump inhibitors, as I mentioned before, we had a lot of damage, a lot of webbing, a lot of scarring, causing the esophagus not to be able to move easily. Um, and this also led to a higher propensity for esophageal cancer in people living with systemic sclerosis. Um, and thank thankfully, uh, due to proton pump inhibitors and certain hygiene mechanisms, which we'll talk about, that can that has been offset greatly. Um, again, painful reflux flux and sour regurgitation and vomiting comes from this next area here, the stomach. Um, and sometimes, again, the stomach does not work as um, efficiently as we 
would want it to in systemic sclerosis and who can sit in the stomach causing pressure, causing um, gas pressure and also causing vo um, volume pressure, causing discomfort and bloating and cramping. Um, and then moving down into the, um, the small intestines, we can develop poor absorption, um, bacterial overgrowth again because the um, the uh, the GI tract doesn't move and doesn't function as as we would like it to, um, and we can also moving further down along the GI tract to the large intestine, the bowels, we can experience poor motility again with um, constipation, colonic inertia, or diarrhea, um, and fear of with um, fear of soiling. Um, and these are all common problems, not everybody's problem, but common problems in systemic sclerosis. So um, I would just like folks to take a quick minute and maybe write three things down that are most troubling to them, um, just to take some time with yourself regarding your GI tract. Any three things that you would like to focus on this week. And maybe this type of check-in is something that we can do with, with ourselves daily or weekly, because in systemic sclerosis, sometimes these manifestations that we're experiencing, um, there's so many of them that can be quite overwhelming that sometimes it's okay to focus on the one thing or the three things that are really impacting us the most and try to get those um, under management, better management, easier management. So again, I put this slide in here again because I really do feel that this is essential and foundational to befriending the systemic sclerosis gut and this understanding that um, the gut influences the rest of the body and the rest of the body influences the gut. Um, and so on this note, I want to bring up the microbiome, as I promised that I would. And the microbiome is the constellation, the garden of, of microbes, um, bacteria, um, and any other microbes, sometimes these are fungal elements and sometimes these are viral particles that live in the gut. Um, they also live on our skin, but the gastrointestinal microbiome has been pivotal in research of the last decade. It's also been pivotal in research as done by Dr. Tracy Freck, as done by Dr. Elizabeth Volkman in, uh, in our understanding of systemic sclerosis with the hypothesis that in systemic sclerosis, um, Dr. Volkman uh, has a recent study demonstrating that, that in systemic sclerosis, there's a dysbiosis, meaning there's a, a, um, uh, a less, less than happy array of, or community of bugs in our gut. And um, that the hypothesis of this is that if we were to enhance and have more diversity and have a more happier bug environment in our gut, then we could be happier physically uh, as a person with or without systemic sclerosis. Um, and these studies have been demonstrated in, in many, many arenas um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, certain autoimmune diseases, uh, uh, the impact of cancer, that a healthier microbiome um, uh, can lead to uh, less uh, cancer, less autoimmunity, uh, autoimmune diseases, um, and that the healthier our gut, um, the impact that it has on depression and that it has on cognition 
um, it's pretty clear, the literature is pretty clear on this. So what we want to do is we want to feed our happy gut, our, our microbiome family that's living in our gut so that the happier bugs get to proliferate, get to take over. And these happier bugs, what do they love? They love diversity and healthy, happy foods, not processed foods. Um, a, a variance of um, uh, more um, whole grain foods. And do you know what? The other thing that microbiome loves is exercise. Um, and that is um, exercise that comes with um, uh, moving our bodies, that comes with singing, and also a, the type of exercise that comes with mindful breathing. Um, and so um, there's certainly going to be more studies, I'm certain, coming from Dr. Freck and coming from uh, Dr. Volkman on the microbiome and systemic sclerosis. Um, so, so let's just look at this concept of exercise and the gastrointestinal system. So in exercise, our diaphragm um, is a very important aspect. So here we have, here, I hope you can see my cursor, but what we're looking at is we're looking at the thoracic cage. This is not the best uh, diagram, but here we have the chest and below it here we have the entire abdominal cavity. And we have the diaphragm overlying all of this, separating these two cavities. So in exercise, um, as the diaphragm is exercised, moving up, and moving down, it's causing, um, when we breathe in uh, with exercise and expanding our breath, we have this exertional force, this mechanical force. Everybody just try it now. Put your hands across your uh, rib cage, the bottom of your rib cage, take a deep breath in against your forearms or your arms, feel that tightness, and you just felt your diaphragm. And then you can feel how, when we take a deep breath in, there's a bit of pressure that comes down into the belly. That's a mechanical force that's massaging the contents of the abdomen. That's really important. But also important is when that diaphragm moves up and down, there's a prefer pre uh, pressure differential of air. We're talking about um, a, a pneum pneumatics. So we're having a negative positive pressure differential happening, yes, within the lungs as we breathe in and breathe out, but also in the diaph in the um, abdominal cavity where mo most of the uh, gastrointestinal uh, system uh, lies. And so in addition to that, mechanical force of the diaphragm, we're also having these pressure differentials stimulating the vasculature, stimulating the nerves, and stimulating baroreceptors throughout the chest cavity. Um, and so this is, this is super uh, important in understanding how exercise can influence and create comfort in the GI tract. But further to this, is that there is, when we're breathing in, when we're breathing out, there is autonomic uh, stimulation. So when we're drawing, drawing in breath, we're stretching baroreceptors that influence the autonomic nervous system. And then when we're breathing out, standing the out breath, we're also slowing down our heart rate, engaging these um, uh, quote unquote baroreceptors um, that are sp sometimes stretch receptors and sometimes chemical receptors that actually cause relaxation um, within the chest and that translates to neuronal neurotransmission to the gut. Um, so that the parasympathetic engages. And remember that the gut loves the parasympathetic system because it creates a smooth, slow, peaceful feeling in the gut. And that's what the gut loves. And that's what the microbiome loves. So um, 
yes, and what else did I want to share with you on this slide? So, uh, okay. Uh, so moving, moving is essential for gut health. Um, and the more, the more fit we are, there's a good chance the less that we are breathing problems that we're going to have. This is something that we know, but also the less we are going to perhaps experience symptoms of gastrointestinal discomfort. Um, and that's because moving enhances GI motility, helps food move along, increases salivation, helps us wet food both in the mouth and secretion in the uh, in the um, small intestines and motility in the large intestines. So, and singing is another um, is another intervention. Um, and what's good for the lungs again is good for the gut. So, singing is a great thing for the lungs. Singing um, strengthens that diaphragm, and we know strengthening the diaphragm leads to better core health, better balance, less back pain. Um, and and singing is also um, linked to increased salivation. So something that I've been telling patients to do is when they're preparing food, think about humming to yourself or singing to yourself in preparation for your own eating. And also after eating, um, when you're cleaning up the dishes, um, perhaps humming or singing to yourself then. And in terms of uh, a postprandial walk, as we call it, uh, meaning after meal walk or a little bit of gentle activity, that can also help with um, increasing food tolerance. And just um, so everyone knows, we're going to be coming out with a, a pretty large article on exercise in systemic sclerosis. Uh, um, uh, we will be sharing that online if you go to. Uh, uh, my um, page in my Facebook page, um, but it's our group is an international group called G Force, and and it's going to it look um, intensely at gastrointestinal um, uh, impact that exercise has. So looking at oral the oral cavity and systemic sclerosis. This is essential to our mouth health and systemic sclerosis. Finding a dentist that's willing to learn about systemic sclerosis is really important. Um, sometimes, especially when we have a small aperture, a small um, mouth because of facial tightening, um, uh, having access and being willing to contact pediatric dentists if the adult dentist you've been seeing is unable to assist in, in an optimal way. Um, twice daily mouth care, um, Janet Pool, facial exercises. If you look on the Scleroderma Foundation website, Dr. Janet Poole, who is also part of our G-Force network, um, she provides facial exercises that can help with mouth health. She also has um, a presentation dedicated to mouth health. Um, and it's important if you have systemic sclerosis to work to keep your mouth moist with sips of water, uh, um, some uh, perhaps uh, sugar-free candies. Um, but remember, sometimes these artificial sweeteners can, can be very uh, harsh in terms of GI symptoms. Um, Pro-salivary um, uh, compounds such as um, biotin, toothpaste, mouth sprays, rinses, gums, these can also help. So again, I want to really emphasize um, not just seeing them once, but seeing them again and again. Dr. Janet Poole's lectures, she has several of them for facial exercises and mouth health. Um, again, facial exercises, we think, um, just like singing, can enhance salivation. Um, and again, I already gave you my spiel about salivation, and so let's move on to the esophagus and systemic sclerosis. Now, in this diagram, it's a, it's a cartoon, but what I wanted to share in this diagram is a general understanding of how systemic sclerosis um, works. Um, 
or the, the mechanisms of systemic sclerosis. So what we have here is we have the esophagus here. So we see this is a long muscle that's, that reaches out into the stomach. And so what we have here though, as we have everywhere in the body, is we have a convergence of blood vessels. And this is um, this little friend here um, that wrap around um, our organs. And along with the blood vessels, we have nerves. And so why am I showing this? Because um, dysfunction in systemic sclerosis, whether we're talking about the skin or whether we're talking about the GI tract, often involves um, impairments of um, blood supply, and that impacts the, how the nerves function. And the gastrointestinal tract is dependent on nerve function to, um, to work properly, to have its wave, its peristaltic wave, to move food along. So this is this is essential. And so well, this is again talking about exercise, preserving uh, blood vasculature, circulation, enhancing circulation, uh, and then therefore providing the nerves with what they need. This is this is important. And so what happens in systemic sclerosis? There are we believe primarily it's a vascular phenomena that results that that results in injury that ends up causing fibrosis and inflammation first inflammation that transforms to scarring and when when an area of our body is scarred um, um, if it's scarred extensively it just cannot function so if you think about pulmonary fibrosis it cannot function optimally um, or we think about the GI tract. And if we focus on um, uh, enhancing our circulation, we might be able um, to stay and to protect to some degree the sequela of inflammation and uh, fibrosis because we know that exercise and enhanced circulation helps to decrease inflammation. Um, but these are all hypotheses that will be further investigated. So here, I wanted to show you what happens to the food bolus goes down um, into the mouth, down the um, esophagus, and, um, and then into the stomach. And so what we're seeing here is we're seeing a, a cutout picture of the esophagus. And what I wanted to show you, so who is the happy food bolus traveling down the esophagus? But you see here, it's even though these are these waves that you're seeing right here, these are the waves of peristalsis, of food moving along. Um, but what you see here is that the inner side of the esophagus, that even though it's a wave, they're smooth. And but in systemic sclerosis, what can happen is, is that this area gets scarred and the, the muscle around this area can get, be scarred as well and therefore not work optimally, not have an optimal wave. Or you might get webbing. And this is where um, folks may need assistance from the uh, gastroenterologist for stretching. And again, in this day and age, we've seen much, 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 much less of these invasive, painful stretching and dilating operations, thankfully to um, better um, reflux hygiene, we'll talk about that in a minute, but also PPIs, uh, proton pump inhibitors. So you may say, I don't have heartburn. Um, I don't have reflux. I'm not experiencing it. Well, so how we experience reflux is very individual, number one. But generally speaking, it takes a lot of acid to recruit a painful experience. So you may have severe reflux, but you may not be experiencing the pain relate that, that is so commonly spoken of um, in relationship to reflux. Um, and so this is really important. And so this is what's happening. So this is the person that does not have reflux. They have a nice tight uh, sphincter that's protecting. It's a muscle protecting the, um, the it's a gateway protecting the uh, esophagus from the acid splashing back. And this is what happens in um, people that have GERD is just that this, this, um, sphincter is not so tight and so acid can travel back up into the um 
esophagus and, and result in injury, what's known as Barrett's esophagitis, which again related to adenocarcinoma and these strictures and scarring requiring stretching. And that led to that higher incident that we spoke about later of malnutrition and mortality. So reflux, hygiene, essential, gravity is our friend. So I instruct all of my patients, share with them this information that elevating the head of the bed is important. However you do it, get it to at least 60 degrees. You can use a wedge pillow, stuff something under the mattress, put a block under the legs of the bed, or get yourself an adjustable bed and have lots of fun with that one. But um, but but what we see um, uh, here is that uh, with gravity, um, we can allow um, the acid to remain more so in the stomach. Um, so reflux hygiene entails smaller meals, especially in the evening and for avoiding cafe, caffeine after noon and um, the use of anti-reflux medication. And very importantly, remember, right is not right in reflux. So look at how the stomach uh, configuration um, allows for protection of the esophagus if you're sleeping on the left side. Look at what it does if you're sleeping on the right side. What happens is uh, if you're sleeping on the left side, you have a nice basin here which invites the uh, fluid levels of acid and food contents to kind of sit in this protected basin. And when you're on the right side, it spills over, part of which, which can spill into the esophagus. So right is not right. We try to sleep on the left side um, or on your back. Um, also, um, poor sleep quality significantly impacts various areas of health. We've already talked about how poor sleep quality impacts inflammation, psychosocial health, cognitive function. But sleep quality is very important in systemic sclerosis, and it's an opportunity for intervention. If, if you're having poor sleep quality, um, we uh, we, we try to assess for whether folks have um, sleep apnea. And if folks do have sleep apnea, then we really encourage them to use their CPAP machine. And the reason for this is that could help, the force from the CPAP machine can help drive back the, the reflux. Um, and the other thing about uh, reflux in systemic sclerosis that I want to talk about, go back to this, is that um, not only is reflux bad for the esophagus, but reflux is also bad for already sensitive lungs. It incites, we know it incites inflammation into the lungs. And so um, having better sleep hygiene related to um, reflux is really, important not just for the esophagus but also for the lungs again that theme of how of how the body affects every uh is interrelated um these are gastroparetic diet is very well described online um in other um, talks so please go in and have a look at at those so now let's focus on symptom relief and, and sensation intervention. And let's just start briefly with medications. Many, many medications can be culprits. And so we need just to pay attention to these, go back and talk to our doctor about these. The same with, you know, if we're having systemic sclerosis symptoms that are not managed that impact how we feed ourselves, um, we wanna talk about this with our uh, scleroderma physician. Um, Vitamins can be heavy sitting in the stomach. Prednisone, people with uh, on systemic sclerosis should really not be on doses of prednisone higher than 10 milligrams because of renal crisis. Um, but prednisone is an irritant to the stomach and, um, and, and other aspects of the gastrointestinal tract. NSAIDs, we're in pain, what do we do? But NSAIDs can really irritate our gastrointestinal tract and really influence the uh, fluid levels um, of the gastrointestinal tract. Opioids, again, pain, this includes tramadol, uh, can interfere with the motility of the um, GI tract as well as interfering with our sleep, fractionating our sleep. Mycophenolate mofetil, it's a very important drug in systemic sclerosis. However, we have to get used to it. Um, we may need to start at smaller doses and um, slowly 
taper up, titrate up. Mycophenolate can be related to diarrhea, can be related to nausea, but most of the time we can manage these symptoms. Methotrexate and hydroxychloroquine can be associated with um, also with nausea, dyspepsia, nintinitib, um, uh, about uh, uh, maybe up to two thirds of people experience discomfort with nintinitib. Uh, many patients with systemic sclerosis might be on the tricyclic antidepressant, which causes drying. And drying at the mouth, which is very important, again, salivation when we're eating, but also contribute to constipation. Um, so really important if you think that um, that any of these medications are interfering um, with your gastrointestinal functioning or health, um, address these with your scleroderma physician. Artificial sweeteners, again, create bloating, cramping in, in some people, uh, quite a few people, I should say. Caffeine, again, uh, uh, lowers the, uh, and alcohol lowers the, uh, the intensity of that. In esophageal sphincter and the muscles uh, causing uh, yes increased reflux but also perhaps uh, perhaps uh, less motility in the GI tract and antibiotics um, uh, we have to again keep this conversation open with our physicians antibiotics could uh, increase our uh, experience of diarrhea and other GI symptoms so let's uh, look at water we're just about running out of time so uh, Staying hydrated is important. We have some, but Tracy Freck did a number of studies on probiotics to influence uh, now what we know as the microbiome. I really love this guy. Um, and just a quick note on food tolerance because we are running out of time. Um, foods that nourish, easy to eat, easy to swallow, and that are comfort for the body. That's what we want to focus on. And the elements of good, good nutrition are paying attention to the most nutritional foods on the plate first. Um, and, and taking time. It takes time to choose good food. It takes time to prepare good food. And so making that peace with ourselves ahead of time is really important. Um, these are the things that influence some food tolerance, the time of day that we eat, eating in the morning, we might tolerate something better than late at night, the amount of food, the combinations with other foods, how we're preparing foods. If we're using vinegar or lemon, that can help break down and digest food textures ahead of time, as long as we don't leave too much of it sitting there to irritate us. So uh, uh, is, are these big pieces, small pieces, pureed, all of these things, how much spice, what spice, does, is it a helpful spice or is it a spice that's irritating? Again, time to chew and our relationship to activity. So another saying the same. So just an example of red pepper, sweet red pepper as one um, uh, example of how we cut it, use it, cook it, or don't cook it, how that can make us feel different depending on what we do with it. Um, and always keep some healthy snacks with us for nutrition. I say at least three different types of snacks. Um, and um, avocado is a great soft food highly nutrient almond butters cashew butters nut butters soft cheeses again these are our experience and again look at um a kitchen prep equipment that's out there for those of us that have um impaired some impaired function um, spend time looking at what could be right for you out there um and looking at storage ideas um watch a lot of food shows and remember be with others hook up with groups. Um, this is our uh, scleroderma diet study. Again, I'll leave this up here for a moment. And I just want to say um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to the Blue Bonnet group. Thank you, Dr. Sakahu. We're going to bring Misty Chapman and Stacy Graff back on. There they are. Oops, I'm on. I'm going to cut myself off. <laughs> Stacey and Misty are going to come on and they're going to ask you a few questions. We're running yeah. a little bit late, so we're going to keep the questions short. Hi, Dr. Sakati. Um, yeah. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Um, our first question is, um, is there a threshold for determining if slash when two feedings may be required, specifically in relation to patients with recurring SIBO, carbohydrate malabsorption, and recurring weight loss? Hmm. Yeah. So. Um, 
it's really important, first of all, that um, that there's good communication um, and detailed communication between the scleroderma specialist and your gastrointestinal physician and nutritionist. Um, the threshold uh, is individual. Um, if it's perceived that there's a transient issue that may be impacting whether or not uh, an NG tube uh, for nutrition uh, could be of use, or if this is a long-term problem that is projected. Um, generally speaking, if patients are experiencing rapid weight loss that is ongoing uh, and, and that are not able to meet their nutritional needs for, and these, these parameters are different with different doctors, different discussions, different patients. But, but for me, if I'm seeing that a, a patient is, um, has lost uh, unintentionally 10% um, uh, of their body weight, um, is unable to keep food down. And this is something that we keep track of. It, it, uh, scleroderma specialists, the scleroderma centers. Um, then that is a discussion that I'm going to start with that patient before we get to that point of losing s such a percentage of the body weight. Um, and I would like to say that using interventional conduits like NG tubes, like uh, ga uh, gastric tubes um, and J tubes, these can be temporizing measures in order to enhance somebody's health that may not need to be continued um, indefinitely, but it can provide the boost that somebody in a difficult position um, at a point in their time in their life could benefit from. Um, and oftentimes when we are considering um, these types of medical interventions, it seems like the end of the world, but it can be something to get us over a hump um, and get us to a healthier state so that, um, uh, so that we can live better, live healthier and live fuller lives. I hope that answered the question. It's a difficult, it's not an easy answer to that question, but I hope it's satisfactory. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I'm going to ask a question that a few people asked. Um, do you recommend any pre or probiotics? Oh, okay. Any particular pre or probiotics? <clears throat> the question is, do you, yeah. do you recommend any pre or probiotics? Yes. So I, Personally, um, based on work done by Tracy Freck, based on uh, new work in, in microbiome, I think uh, I think if you're trying to enhance your microbiome, um, I think it's it's a good idea. I think it's very important what you're choosing. You want to choose a reputable company. You want to choose a company that um, uh, standardizes their products um, and um, Right, yeah. So, I mean, not all products are equal. Um, so, so that's going to be an important aspect. Um, and I think that um, speaking to nutritionists, um, they might be able to even prescribe a particular um, pre or probiotic for your individual needs. Right. Thank you. And then one last question. Um, how is GI dysfunction and progression of scleroderma in the gut assessed? Okay, so um, there's so many ways that it's assessed. First of all, um, clinically, it's really important that we have these discussions about the GI tract, um, upper, lower, oral health, um, every time we see our patients. Even though that your scleroderma specialist is not uh, a trained gastroenterologist, uh, a scleroderma specialist at a scleroderma center uh, spends a lot of time learning about the GI tract and knows how to ask the questions that will get the answers that we need to know in order to improve 
quality of life and GI function and to know that something is going right or something is not going right. Um, so, so first of all, it's history is what you tell um, your doctors um, in terms of the symptoms, in terms of your sensations. Um, and um, uh, other than that, um, we refer to gastroenterology for um, a number of any number of tests. Quite often, it would be an endoscopy, upper endoscopy, that will examine the um, the esophagus, uh, look at the stomach. At something I didn't mention uh, related to gastrointestinal health and systemic sclerosis is um, also that just like we get telangiectasias, which are the blood vessels that rise to the surface of the skin and they look disorganized. We can have that same experience throughout the G GI tract, and um, and especially if you're having low um, blood counts, and we don't know why you're having low blood counts, um, we are going to want to know if you have those um, ectasias, is what we call them. They're like telangiectasias, referred to as gastric ectasias. We want to know if they're in the stomach because they could be easily abraded and cause a bleed. So that's that's endoscopy, um, uh, upper endoscopy. We might use a colonoscopy um, to to examine the the, the colon. Um, there's a, a number of other studies like swallowing studies. We might employ it to, to look to see how somebody is using their oral pharyngeal muscles and using the esophagus during swallowing and if there's any blockages in there. Um, we might uh, be able to also see if there's reflux. The other thing that we use sometimes when we just Got, when we speak with patients and it sounds like they could have gastroparesis, with, which means sitting of food in the stomach for longer than it should, we might get what's called a gastric emptying study. And this is where um, a compound is swallowed uh, that lights up. And then we're able to see how long is it staying in the stomach? How long does it take to move through the stomach? Um, we, uh, we also use sometimes um, a pH probe um, less so because we, which diagnoses uh, reflux, but less so because in systemic sclerosis, why do an intervention when you know it's there? Why put patients through that? And I think that's the other thing that's important about going to at least having yearly or bi-yearly visits at a scleroderma center is that um, we will do our best to decrease the number of interventions um, based on what we know already to be true about systemic sclerosis, which is an important consideration. Um, another, uh, there are um, other studies that look at the pressure, look at the pressure of the um, sphincter of the um, esophagus, but also the, 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 the uh, pressure of the anal sphincter um, to see if that could potentially be a cause for um, fecal incontinence. Um, and again, where if, if you are uh, being considered for a lung transplant, um, a number of these studies will be done to assess whether or not um, another intervention may be needed before lung transplant, which is a, uh, uh, where they tighten up the esophageal sphincter. Thank you. Thank you so much for today. Thank you. We appreciate it. I think we are about out of time. Thank you, Dr. Sakaku. We so Thank much you. appreciate this and uh, we're so happy to have you here.